the central bank has had. Central bank action must be consistent with achieving policy objectives that are forward -looking. The failed effort of the 1970s to support growth at the cost of high inflation illustrates how political interference leads to time inconsistent action. Policymakers believed that by tolerating high inflation, central banks can generate permanently higher levels of employment. The outcome was both higher inflation and lower employment as economic agents simply factored in high inflation expectations in their decisions. Giving central banks multiple objectives undermines the time consistency of their action, reducing both accountability and credibility. The second core element of the transition is the development of new technologies and their adoption. Renewable energy provides a good example of how new technologies and their evolution support the transition. Between 2010 and 2020, the cost of solar and wind generation has fallen by 85% and 56% respectively. At the same time, adoption rates have grown exponentially. What role have central banks played in the development of renewable energy technology? The answer is not much. We have neither the skill nor the tools to assist. The major driving forces of green innovation are factors such as carbon taxation, research and development, investment and equity funding, often in the form of venture capital. These fall entirely within the mandates of government, which are responsible for taxation and a variety of incentives to encourage research and development spending and equity funding. The best way for a central bank to support technology development and adoption is not by funding it, but by being better at reducing the cost associated with inflation, hedging, and financial instability. Lower and stable inflation reduces risk premiums and also translates into less volatile exchange rate. The last element is infrastructure. to invest 250 billion US dollars over the next three decades. We are not infrastructure financiers as a And we have seen that infrastructure budgets are often not spent. There is little we can do to improve the different phases of developing and executing a project, which are often listed as the main obstacles to infrastructure development in South Africa. What then can central banks do? If funding is important, then our focus should be on ensuring macroeconomic stability. This has been identified as a major driver of green funding in emerging and developing economies by global patients. In a survey conducted by the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, close to 90% of global pension funds state that corruption, political risk, and macroeconomic stability 
are important considerations in their investment decisions. This compares to 59% that identify regulation related to environment, social and corporate governance issues as an important one. <laughs> Let me talk about why maintaining price stability is important. When it comes to maintaining price stability, some economists have made the case for more inflationary approaches to monetary policy to help prevent large relative price shocks from reducing growth. It is argued that nominal GDP and income targeting would better protect economic activity given expected price volatility associated with mitigation intervention and uncertainty with the outlook. For many emerging and developing economies, however, low and stable inflation create wide-ranging benefits that go beyond any gains that might occur from tolerating higher inflation. These include having clear nominal incomes, lower inflation premiums and interest rates, better access to foreign savings, and better protection from global shocks. There, these are but some of the benefits and in turn support green investment. When it comes to financial stability, the legislative mandate of the South, we need to identify the short to medium term climate related risks. We have to think about how we can measure their effect. We need to be clear about the limitations of our framework, and we must be in a position to design effective intervention to increase the resilience of the business. The most immediate risks are not linked to rising temperatures. They are linked to more frequent floods and droughts and how technology evolves. They are linked to the development of new financial instruments and funding models to support the transition. And they are also linked to the introduction of carbon taxation and broader tax adjustments, policy coordination failure, and the implications of an uneven global transition. Our role is also to help financial markets have the right information to assess accurately the merits of transition projects. Here, the introduction of globally consistent taxonomy and disclosure rules are critical in improving market efficiency and ensuring financial stability. Our experience with the COVID-19 crisis shows that we can face new risks, adapt quickly, and ensure that financial stability is maintained. In addition to maintaining price and financial stability, we can support the transition by continuing to produce high quality economic research. The work of the network for the green of the financial system and other central banks around climate change has grown exponentially over the last couple of years. One critical area for research is, of course, macro and micro policy coordination and design. This will inform our role in the transition and help us understand the risk of mission creep. The multidisciplinary nature of climate change requires that we develop new skills and partnerships to analyze the different impacts, develop new models, and understand how technologies will evolve. Developing good models and producing quality research requires that. We have an important role to play in developing new data sources and providing quality information to households and firms. In conclusion, the contribution of central banks to climate change-related objectives and their contribution 
to the transition is conditional on government policy action. The biggest levers of the transition sit with microeconomic policies. Well-designed and coordinated actions generate an orderly green transition while minimizing any unintended consequences. For example, policy actions to help workers to be and relocate to greener firms will maximize employment gain. Reducing the cost of new technologies through an appropriate mix of incentives and the removal of trade tariffs will lower transition costs. This will also support the development of new industries. Transitioning the electricity, the electricity sector more rapidly to grid generation can be a major catalyst for investment in sectors across the economy. Central banks have an important role to play in the climate transition. It is to maintain financial and price stability, produce analytical work in support of policy making, and address financial market data gaps. These will enable an environment for financial institutions to provide green funding for companies to invest in new technologies and for productive capacity, as well as for households <coughs> to shift their consumption patterns. Our actions will be effective only if they fall within our mandate and as part of a bigger government response. Climate change is a reality. It is countries can act individually. We need to act in concert as a global community for we have only one planet. One part of the planet is policy and the other is not policy. The planet will get warmer all the Thank you. If you don't mind, I will change the question. Um, ladies and gentlemen, um, we get to the, the official thank you for, for the governor will be done by the lawyer. Sure. But at this juncture, we'd like to open it up for some uh, questions from the, from the floor to engage with the governor. You're welcome to do so. Can, can I just ask if you state your name and then possibly just move your question? Good to see you again, Governor. Uh, good engagement uh, yesterday. Uh, my name is Sandy. Um, I, I know you mentioned quite a few things, and um, you uh, alluded to the fact that it is not the sole responsibility of the um, central bank. Uh, to provide a platform where we can transition from uh, fuel um, and unfriendly energy into a more friendly energy that is better for the climate. Um, we've seen, obviously, a, a counterpart, or at least one sector of the government at the beginning of this career. Uh, uh, where they provide the tax rates of people who are not investing uh, in solar, uh, and which is something that is commendable. Uh, and it's one arm of, of, of government playing their role. Question that I have, maybe um, on your side, uh, Governor, we all know that the union reduction uh, in, 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 in use of coal energy. It has not been as a result um, of, a, of a director change. It has been because of the inefficiencies uh, within um, ESCOM. We know now there's more and more of the stations that are, that are actually being fixed. Some of the inefficiencies are actually being resolved. What happens um, with the investment that is taking place now where there is this perception that it is expensive 
Uh, we all know that not everybody can afford to install a solar. People will naturally go back to what is deemed as cheap, which is coal energy. Um, what is your view in terms of accelerating this? Because at the moment we've benefited as a result of the inefficiencies uh, to the power generator at the moment. Uh, what is your view in terms of uh, how can we stimulate and, and promote it um, that it becomes a sustainable thing that we do not default back into the use of coal energy? Thank you. We'll take a couple. And Thank you. Good evening, everyone. My name is Jessica Fraser. I uh, teach at this uh, business school on the MBA program, and I focus on strategic operations management and supply chain. My question to the governor, if we are looking at the rest of the world and they are planning things for COP28 coming up, they are speaking about compensation of loss and damage funds as a means of climate finance. But if you do your job too well with macroeconomic stability, then they will see us as the first world country here in Africa. So what is the risk of us not being eligible for loss and damage funds? Thank you. Was there a hand that I made in this? Yep. Cindy, there's one up here. And then we're going to go to the back first up here. Yep. Okay, well, I don't need a microphone. No, we'll need it for the people who are online. Oh, you do, do you? Uh, well, good evening, Governor. Thank you so much for your chat. Oh, it was very, very interesting. My name is Mark. Um, my, my question really is, and I don't want to put a damper on transition to green, okay? but my understanding is that the continent of Africa generates about 4% of CO2 in the globe. And frankly, I don't know why we want to spend a lot of money getting ourselves in an expensive conversion. I think going forward, I think we accelerate as fast as we can at green energy. But we should make the most of what we've got. Because frankly, what China does and what the state does just puts anything we do in transition in the shade. I mean, it, it has very little effect. But perhaps I've got it wrong and I'd very much like to get your point. The, the, the hand at the back, back. Right? and it's really going to give you some exercise. Though. Uh, we also refer to it as audience participation. <laughs> yeah, hello, sir. Um, Mr. Um, my name is Razak. I'm a student of economics. I'm currently I'm doing my research on the climate change. Uh, specifically, I'm actually trying to find a way to nudge people to create awareness about the climate change and to make them understand that it's a collective responsibility. That means when the government is playing their role, we also need to play our role. Because the fact remains that uh, it's not a problem that uh, can be solved overnight. Because the climate problem does not develop overnight. It's a, a gradual process. And um, this is my question, sir. I, specifically in the Eastern Cape, the major problem I mean, in, in the world that climate change actually affects us is two droughts. And uh, many people will agree with me that uh, we have recorded a lot of, uh, especially people in the agricultural sector, they, we have had a lot of uh, 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 livestock mortality. And, um, Here's my question, sir, because I actually want to use uh, the markets, the market reality to back my question. Two months ago, the price of chicken at spa is different, totally different from what we have today. 
as far. If you find a, a tray, a small tray of chicken, as at last two months, it was sold at the rate of 40 rand, 25 rand, 88 rand. But two days ago, I was shocked that the price has increased to like 60, 70 or so. Now, and this is purely the case of because uh, a lot of uh, a, a, a lot of people who are operating in the livestock uh, sector cannot longer cope with the issue of the climate change because of water scarcity and so on. Uh, so the question, my my uh, so the prices of agriculture product right as a result of what? What is the Central Monetary Authority doing to ensure that because this uh, uh, problem is not something we have to have part of? What is the what is your role, sir? What are the problems to be to ensure that uh, the kinds of agricultural products in South Africa in a such a way that a common man will be able to find a way to feed their asshole. Thank you. Okay. Um, um, you know, um, I, uh, um, I, I visited my new boss uh, in, uh, in Kenya, and they, they slaughtered as a sheep. And so my son said, um, you are so cruel. Why are you slaughtering this sheep? Don't you know, guys know where the good is? <laughs> and uh, I got a buffer because you see, you're talking about the price of chicken and then the chicken has been the for the spark. <laughs> and, and, um, uh, but, I guess the point that you are hearing is also what I have raised. The agricultural sector feels the <coughs> pressure from climate change almost immediately more than the other. But think of it this way as a government that is failing. At the time that the Christian Cape was experiencing drought, we were experiencing floods as well in the land. Because the way in which these things work is that Generally, you say we are in a drought, and you plan for the drought, and that is how you do. Now, imagine the nightmare in government. You have to plan for both the drought and the floods that take place at the, uh, at the same time. So this thing is a, is a, is, is a reality. Well, you asked uh, what uh, the point, though, is that in the example that you gave, the price of chicken, had nothing to do with climate change. It has to do with something else. A pandemic, which was the alien flu. And uh, so these pathogens now, <coughs> we spread and they were catching so many different things. And I'm glad uh, you, <coughs> at least you were talking uh, uh, chickens, so it does, doesn't matter, it looks like the debate is settled. Because the other chefs went, so went to the same supermarket looking for eggs, mm -hmm. and the eggs couldn't find the eggs. <laughs> These are the drivers of those things have to do with the effects of climate change. Is enough reason for us to deal with climate change. Several of them, we do not pick one price and we deal with it. We deal with what we call the law of big numbers. So it's all the other goods and services in the economy. And that is what we focus on. And if there has to be a direct intervention, it got to be clear. At the moment, our farmers cannot supply the chicken. The, the Minister of Trade and Industry introduced a draft or was talking about releasing the tariffs so that we can get the chicken from elsewhere because we do not. And we do not, we do not have. You cannot, you cannot get it. And it looks like to stop our uh, chickens production, we will have to import some 
eggs that are in some condition that would uh, come here and then they can hatch, they can produce the chicken. So it looks like we will finally know which one came first. <laughs> 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 So, so that is what you face. So we, we, we cannot deal with sexual crisis. We have to deal with overall uh, uh, price, uh, price values. But what you have raised comes down rather, rather to what Mark had raised. See, Mark says that Africa only emits 4%. And he says that why should we worry about uh, the, uh, the transition, we should be talking about moving faster towards a uh, green instead of uh, constraining uh, ourselves. And that makes sense, Mark. The problem is, in that four percent that is uh, Africa, South Africa accounts for the biggest chunk of the world. And we emit more per unit of output than any other country. So you're raising an important question. And I said that if we continue to emit, we will continue to reduce the gases into the atmosphere. The planet will warm up. And that is why you need a global solution. And that is why the debate is that you can't then say that. Africa must do the transition on its own. It must adapt and must also mitigate against the effects of climate change. And yet the effects of climate change are from a past of people who had emitted uh, before us. But we can't come and say, because they have emitted in the past, we also demand the right to emit. And that is why the global conversation is, you've got to compensate, which then links back to Jessica's question which says that there are these funds that are being created to allow for compensation and the damage that is that is caused. And that is why I said you need a global uh, conversation, because if you go for a country by country, I think we are not going to get that. And meanwhile, the temperature rises, it rises for the whole planet. It, it won't say that a uh, of has emitted for the past 100 years, and, and we have not been emitting. So they stop emitting and we emit. The planet still gets warm. And in the final analysis, we are all wizards. And that is why we needed this conversation. And it's in the conversation that we have got to bring to fore, to the fore, that we have got a collective responsibility and that the cost of adaptation and mitigation have got to be Equitably shared, not equal, equitably shared. That those with the resources and um, and emitted so much in the past should be available. Uh, and all of these things are coming. But you see, Radak says that he has he's been trying to convince the public to make them aware and all of this. But <clears throat> Think of a difficult conversation we have in South Africa. The difficult conversation we have in South Africa is that our electricity is produced predominantly from coal. We do not have much of coal. We must make the transition. We have got old plants that are based on all the technology that are emitting so much, but they are also not very reliable. They keep on breaking. And we say that. Okay, we're going to shut them down and we must replace them with uh, the greener technology. But then it also says that the, replace, the amount of replacement must compensate fully for what you have, that otherwise you are faced with energy insecurity. And that's a conversation that we have got to change society and um, with so that they understand what we are facing. Let me tell you what, what complicates the what complicates the conversation with society? What complicates the conversation with society is Russia invades Ukraine. And when they invaded Ukraine, they closed the gas pipeline to Europe. Or they reduced the gas pipeline to Europe. So Europe doesn't have gas. 
And Europe is worried winter is coming and the European winter is not like a South African winter. You will freeze if you do not have heating. So what do the Europeans uh, do? They say, South Africa, please send us the coal. You say, sorry, you said we must close the power stations, but now you say we must send you the coal. What are you going to do with the coal? Because you're going to admit. They said, no, energy security. And uh, so I have just returned from an international negotiation and I said, we agree with you, energy security. You need it. But what makes European energy security more important than South African energy security? Can we have the conversation? Can we agree that we are in this together and that if we are making commitment, we all follow up on the same commitment and not do the double uh, the double standard? It's a very important conversation to have, and these conversations are not easy, which basically could mean that uh, our diplomats that we send out there are going to have to be very good climate diplomats to articulate our uh, our concern uh, because you actually do need this bill to be a global uh, a global a global solution and so i am saying these things not because i am skeptical about the transition if the transition is the right thing to do it is going to be costly but you cannot shift the cost to developing countries that are going to have to do this for the benefit of the whole globe, and there is no compensation and uh, damage compensation and uh, transition and all of that stuff without that taking place, it would be an unfair thing. Which then brings me to Sandy's question about accelerating the process towards the renewables. And the example that he has given that reinforces the point I was making, that the power lies in government with its multiplicity of instruments. So he is a banker and he, I know he has the figures of what has been happening because any bank worth its salt saw the announcement about the incentives for solar panels and immediately started running and offering they are trying to say you can take advantage. You can take advantage of this tax credit and put solar panels on your roof, especially now that they are a good 85% cheaper than what they were a few years uh, a few years ago. We need to put more uh, of this uh, of this. Thing. But you think of this uh, of this uh, at this stage. And people say that there are people who cannot afford it. I don't, I, I don't give business advice, but we are in a business school. <laughs> but why can't somebody think of it? There is a house in Sweden, and that house can't afford a solar panels. What if I put solar panels on that house so that the house can sell into the grid? And because they are now selling into the grid, I get paid until the solar panel is fully paid, and then that house can continue with the solar panel. There are all sorts of opportunities that the transition itself uh, actually uh, uh, offers. And maybe um, being in Plebeja, solar panels maybe not such a cool idea because maybe the sun does not always come. But it's one thing this uh, place doesn't let wind. You are not a windy city for nothing. Right? So, this is where we should be thinking about putting our wind farms because there isn't a shortage of wind here. Can't put wind farms in uh, Limpopo. Right? I mean, I grew up there. We used to wake up very late in the morning waiting for the windmill to turn so that we can get what can put. Uh, a wind farm there, it's not going to work. But it's always so hot today, you can push the solar panels and uh, we will be able to generate electricity. That deals with this round of questions. Bring them coming. Yeah. 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 Shall we have another round? Is that a hand name? Yeah. 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 Ye
Uh, on the topic of climate change, I'd like to say that something that intensifies the carbon emissions and pollution is, you know, really large corporations, global corporations, who really prioritize products, right? And I understand that the Clean Initiative is a one worth taking, but it also has to be mostly to the people who are at the bottom of the tree. So, well, it mostly affects the poor. It, it, it mostly affects the poor more than it does um, people who are able to access resources which are the rich. So, my question is. Um, what are some of the policies that could be implemented to ensure that renewable resource technology is accessible to the poor? And what could be done to ensure that large corporations practice um, social corporate responsibility in order to um, lessen the larger problem at hand, which I think would be the gap between the poor and the rich, or the large income disparity between the what well, I Thank you. Are you ready? Um, there was a hand over here, and I remember there was one over there. Uh, was there another hand here? Um. <laughs> Thank you, Manta Manchong. What's my name? Um. Thanks for the. I think in some of the, uh, the questions, we have kind of touched you on some of the concerns that I had. However, my question that came on or came, kept on uh, 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 moving in my head is that, I wonder if the diagnosis, I heard in your opening presentation, you mentioned the factors that give rise to evil, that give rise to climate change. So now I was kind of wondering if um, the diagnosis that has been done, is it exhaustive? Um, did it cover everything? I will tell you why I'm asking that question. Because um, you mentioned, I think a quote from one of the studies that uh, the physical policy failures leads to a monetary policy uh, and so on, and it hits the uh, the it hits the interest rates, it hits everything, inflation to go up. But that was kind of an open-ended. You came again to give the tools that you are, you think they are assisting or they will assist in in in, in keeping that or in reducing that. However, now as you see that there is this rapid increase. And the statement or the, the code that we have made is kind of open-ended. It does not really go to say, at a particular point, this will drop. So now I was kind of saying now, are we really addressing what we are supposed to be addressing? Or maybe did we really do the right diagnosis? Or did we exhaust our diagnosis? It also emanates from I think during uh, President Zuma era, there was a climate debt that was written off or something of that nature. So I heard you told you spoke of 4% of the emission in Africa and South Africa is the, is the most, but is that all? Are there no other factors? Uh, uh, maybe, uh, I would say, it first, first, first world countries that are also contributing on this? Uh, maybe it's not part of the, the tools that we have brought that we are that we are trying to, to, to deploy in terms of addressing this, this issue. That's, that's my question because I can see that there is this rapid increase and it does not give that okay in these tools at a particular point we hope that it will go down and so on. Yeah. Rapid increase in emission. No, 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 no. And now 
remember the quotes that you have made to say I had, I had three the physical the, the one that was saying the physical physical policy failures they affect the monetary policy oh, okay. and then uh, affects and everything okay. yes okay. yes i'm referring to that one thank you okay. Okay. Thank you. 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 It does not imply that the topic of climate change is not important. I think we're dealing in an environment um, where we have a lot of pressure, both from an economic point of view and social point of view. And I think it becomes more imperative now that we prioritize um, properly and we allocate our resources effectively. But I think the point I want to make is even in your, in your, your, your talk, that um, in terms of effectiveness, I think the application of fiscal policy in addressing uh, the um, challenges that we have or the objectives that we have in terms of climate change, I think that's a, for me, it's a, more, it's a better lever to pull to affect that change and um, Rather, the central bank focus and leverage the monetary instruments to maybe address some of the immediate needs in our country, like uh, like inflation. Um, so, well, made a couple of notes here. So, I'm saying there's no denying that climate change is not important, but I think. As a, as a reserve bank, just my opinion, and you even mentioned the, 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 I think you said mission creep, that we, in my view, not try to address uh, something that can be dealt in other governmental departments and focus on the things that will make the reserve bank more effective within our society. Um, yeah, that's basically what we're doing. For me? Dion. People, this will be this will be our last one. Um, thank you. Thank you. Okay. Thank you so much, uh, program director. Okay. My name is Maloan. Uh, Selim Kalichan. I'm a student in this university, and also a member of this. <laughs> uh, allow me to first acknowledge the importance of the conversation and the discussion of course with the uh, uh, it's important on the climate change just transition and so on. That's very important. And I like the fact that we are discussing these issues uh, uh, at, at an advanced uh, level. But I think for me, though I arrived a bit late, apologies for that, uh, I want to put forward one, that just two or three days ago, the ShopRite uh, Food Index uh, report indicated that about 48% about of the South Africans in 2025 would be out of food. I want us to note, and I think that's a cause for us. Secondly, in light of the conversation going on, I want two colleagues as well to note that those white economists are definitely harmonized. That there is a, 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 an act called NEMA. And one of its principles it says that development must be socially, environmentally, and ecologically sustainable. And that the development or the 
conservation of the group must put the interest of the people at the center. Now, coming to South Africa, the situation that we're facing, I'm talking about reality, is that we have an energy issue which the businesses and the banks will tell you how much it has impacted. You've got the issue of skyrocket unemployment. You have the issue of inequality and poverty. We are con say, con conversating today around the issue of climate change. And, and I'm, I'm, I'm glad that, uh, though I was not here, I heard that you did mention that the contribution of Africa as a whole is about 4% in terms of the carbon emission. And if we were to trace that, where is it come from? It comes from mostly from the industrial production. And if we were to look into South Africa and look at the level of the industries that we have, and the countries that are I think it's a drop in the road compared to the developed countries. And I'm afraid at times that we become the people that uh, speak loud about forgetting our own realities. So I want us to have that conversation for those of us. Now, coming back to the result. I have just now, now we hear uh, on the radio that uh, there is uh, uh, something on the card. Then the IP now, again, the rate of our business is called. And I have this, this is something that is very, very important. And I'm thinking in my mind, where can we start looking at that state? <laughs> and they stay in some <laughs> and they not feel in the field like everyone else, but not in the forum. And I was taken aback by the statement that we have made sometime few weeks or so ago that the poor does not get affected by the interest rate. I mean, maybe you will not touch that rate. But the question that I want to <coughs> ask you uh, is this that's one of the measures <coughs> that is meant to increase these details. I'm asking this in light of understanding the social economic reality that are facing. And of course, at the end of what we're talking about, the climate change. Which has got okay, their impact on the food security, on the energy security. But it appears that in my view, the reserve bank does not see that we are now swimming in the sanitation as a country. And it appears that the reserve bank has taken measures that are outside the reality that are facing, but more for the other. Of market related methods, which do I agree are more about protecting the interest of the heads rather than the head. What is the question? In light of the social economic benefits. Okay. Okay. Could you please talk, talk about uh, how we make sure that people have got access to uh, to technology? Think better about this. The nature of the energy that we need, and whether we are able to live our transition. The poor would have to have access to that 
En dat is de kop van wie ik kan, waar ik dit had gezegd. En dat is de reden waar ik frame mijn talk about wat zijn kan brengen te Wat ze basic aan die zee. In dat neural loop. There are various players who are actually editing data. The neural node these things are, are joined. So we are probably playing in one node. That's where we are. There are others that are all uh, joined that we are going to take cognizant of. And you say that the big corporations uh, uh, are after profits. Well, if, if a business does not make profits, its fate is one consequence. It closes. Okay. Uh, there is no bailout from anyone. This is a new problem. Closes. But there has been this big drive that says that businesses are not just driven by profits because profits are just for their shareholders. But businesses have got to be corporate citizens. And so you define the triple bottom line to say that you've got to deal with the shareholder returns, you've got to take care of the environment in which you are operating, and the society within which you operate, and more importantly, that your governance is good. We have seen corporates in South Africa, including state-owned enterprises, which when they were found wanting on governance, what became of them? Both in the private sector, there are businesses in the private sector that were focusing on profit. So it was profit at all costs, including getting to profit by getting involved in corruption and when caught, because the G was not working, the business is gone. And that is why we talk about sustainability. Because that, that business was not sustainable. It was not doing the right thing. So you correct in uh, the manner in which you have raised and uh, you have raised those things. And many businesses are thinking about their um, models. Uh, and they have changed this thing. And I, want, but I, I hope that they are real. Think of a, I'll, I'll use this example in the hydrocarbon sector. Think of a company that used to be called British Petroleum, BP. What is it called now? Beyond Petroleum. Think of a business that used to be called Total Oil. What is it called now? Total Energies. Well, that's all they didn't have the word oil in it. But they are the big driver now in South Africa of green hydrogen. So, by society framing a conversation differently and basically saying to business, you can't continue with your business the way it has always been, or else your business is not going to survive. Businesses change their models. Mm -hmm. And so, the business is changing their models, and we need to change their models. It's a combination of Government regulation and government instruments, both incentives and disincentives. So you incentivize the behavior you would like to see, and you did incentivize the behavior you don't want to see anymore. And that is how you would uh, you would think about. I'm sure. Uh, you said whether the diagnosis uh, covers everything. Uh, I am not sure, but what I gave here as an analysis is at least what the United Nations has agreed on. So globally, we have agreed that there might be other things we are missing. We do not know what we are missing. But given what we know now and the state of science for what it is, this is what we know. Can we deal with it? instead of waiting until we have diagnosed everything by which time we might not be having a planet. <laughs> the stuff that you raised about fiscal and then you said it was open-ended. I don't know whether you heard me. I did say close quote. <laughs> 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 
the thing about what I am doing is to us. For many of us in the emerging markets, development problems. When our economies are analyzed and people do evidence, risks with respect to macroeconomic stability and fiscal risks are a problem. At the moment, South Africa's risk premium is elevated, and it has to do with the perceptions about South Africa's fiscal risks. And hopefully, the Minister of Finance in two weeks' time, when he presents his budget policy system, he might um, alleviate those concerns uh, because of what he, he presents. But the bottom line is that we would be facing risks. And the point I was simply making was that given that we already have those risks, if the transition costs are going to overburden us with additional fiscal risk without the globe stepping in and saying that we have got to be, in Jessica's words, availing, availing um, compensation and damage fund so that the transition continues. That is the point that uh, I was making. And the quote I used there that talked about the fiscal dominance arises when you are faced with a situation that your debt level is elevated, but you continue to spend beyond what you collect in revenue, and so your debt keep on mounting, and because your debt keep on mounting, your interest burden goes up and you end up spending more servicing interest than you are spending on your social needs like education and health, so much so that you start looking for easier solutions. And one of the easier solutions that you would hear some people talk about is why can't the central bank just print money? Okay. <laughs> so 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 that, that's when you get into the era of fiscal dominance that they look at the solution, it got to be the central bank. And sometimes people look at this and they say that these guys have been so successful in uh, reigning in inflation, and because they've been so successful in reigning in inflation, let us give them something more to do. Maybe they will solve that one and then give them more and give them more, and we are into mission three. And then you are then suddenly faced with an institution that was designed to deal with a particular problem. And because they have now been given a multiplicity of objectives, they end up achieving that. And that was the point that uh, I, uh, I was uh, I was making. Dion was the, the, the point of contribution. And should the central events be staying in the end? Part of defining what I was doing you know, was to say, whatever contribution we can make to alleviate climate change has got to be within that limit that society has given of promoting price and financial uh, stability and not be able to meander into that. Because if we go there, the Minister of Education might just turn around and say, oh, the central bank can deal with climate. Surely they can deal with education. The Minister of Health says, surely they can deal with that. And before you know it, you actually do not have a central bank worth anything because it's just it has lost focus. Uh, I, I, I struggled. I mean, okay, your thing was a mixture of comments, actually, mainly comments, uh, which uh, you say we must have a conversation with, I think we can have a conversation with, but I was hoping that you would be asking me that you ask what measures are we taking. And it was a bit uh, uh, confusing, but let me let me engage. Let me engage in this thing. You quoted the issue of possibly some South Africans being without food uh, in 2025. Uh, uh, the study that um, the supermarket chain uh, did that shows that I think that they run uh, uh, these things 
uh, where they provide subsidized rate and so forth. And that is how they, they gather that information. If anything, <coughs> you have made a point that I had made earlier, but not as eloquently as you did. That climate change is real and is affecting the poor. Much more extremely than the rich. Many of the people who can afford have got structures that can withstand floods and all of that. If you are in an informal settlement and you are that hit by floods, there is no way that that informal structure of yours is going to the So the thing that some people tend to gather to say that you must be focusing on poverty and development and, and climate change, this is not quite the, no. Climate change can erode your developmental base. And as we have seen it, the destruction of infrastructure and of people's property and so forth, they become these are real and these are the properties of, uh, uh, of people that uh, we, we have with. Um, I must caution you about social media. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you are saying that I said something a few weeks ago about the poor not being uh, affected by rain. Be very careful, because we are in a university here, that today people know how to use technology. And they are able to use technology to manipulate things to peddle ideas and distort what was actually said. But since you are a student at the university, I will refer you to the full video of what I said, instead of what was extracted by somebody called Prophet Samudra. If you are going to believe a prophet on economics, <laughs> then we have a prophet. But if prophet decided to extract a portion of what was said, took it completely out, chopped what was said before and what was said after, and that is what he peddled. And I just, I, we didn't deem it fit to respond as the reserve bank because we knew exactly what uh, we were saying. When I was baptized, uh, the priest said, do you reject all the false prophets? And I said, yes. <laughs> So, so we will share with you the fullness of what, the, what I said. What was the question that was asked was that you keep interest rates and interest rates are hitting the unemployed. Did you think they were asking about the unemployed, they were talking about the poor and says, listen, you've got to be understanding of this. Somebody who is unemployed. Is not borrowing money, is not investing money. But somebody who is unemployed also has to consume. Whether they are assisted by a family member or they beg or something, they must consume. Inflation affects them too. So, whereas the interest rate gets immediately felt by the people who are engaged in borrowing and lending. Inflation affects all of us, rich, poor, employed, or unemployed. And you have just made the point, by the way, for me, about rising uh, cost of living. And that is the point that was being brought to the fore here to say <laughs> you can't say because you have got unemployment and poverty, you must do nothing about inflation. And in that very same uh, the very same conversation that I had, I made the point that if you take income earners in South Africa and you divide them into decile, decile one and decile two are the lowest income earners. Decile one is zero to some figure and decile two is um, another uh, category, but you will find in there the people who in the main depend on social grants or some family um, assistance and so forth. Inflation was figure was released on Wednesday. That figure came out at 5.4%. 
Do you know what the inflation of those people with low income is? 9.2%. The poor are being hit hardest by inflation. So anybody who comes with a development strategy that says, ignore inflation, that development strategy is anti-poor. Because I have just shown you now, based on statistics of Africa data, how the low income earners are experiencing higher inflation than the rich. The higher, just nine and ten, the top income earners in the country, the <coughs> inflation was 4.3. See the gap somebody was talking about income inequality? It's all oh, it was you. There you go. There is income inequality right there. The rich, what do they spend on? Rises at 2.3%. The poorest <laughs> is rising at 9.2%. Inflation hits all of us, but particularly the poor, because the poor cannot protect themselves against inflation. And so you said you were uh, on the radio that the Reserve Banks there is an imminent announcement about interest rates. You have come here, I am here, <laughs> and I am not aware of any imminent <laughs> <laughs> uh, Our monitoring policy committee meets at every odd month. We met in September. Our next meeting is going to be in November. We will um, assess the data both globally and domestically. We will take a few about how we think the economy is going to evolve, and we will calibrate policy consistent with the, uh, the outlook. And you asked the question, <coughs> where do these people of the Reserve where do they live? <laughs> we live in exactly the same geographic space. And let me say to you that we do not take pleasure in people losing houses. We do not take pleasure in people losing their cars. But hear me out. The first cry of South Africa is this. There is a high cost of living. The cost of living is killing us. How did the high cost of living come about? It came about because inflation was rising. And because inflation is rising, it adds to the cost of living. And you know what? With the rising inflation, what you face is that the income of the working people is eroded. It buys less and less. And um, uh, Razak was giving an example earlier on of the price of chicken. The price of chicken having raised at that percentage. Do you think that his employer gave him that increase in the past month? No way. Which basically means that his income is eroded. And we are going to protect that income. And the way you are going to protect that income in the central way is to rate in inflation. And when we rate in inflation, we are going to administer particular medicine. That medicine we administer is the interest rate. It is not nice medicine. It is bitter. But if the patient does not take the medicine, the patient is going to end up in surgery. And we are not sure whether the patient will come out of this medicine. <laughs> I think I'm going to, I was going to say the government has spoken, but I think we just heard the prophet. Way with a false thing. Governor, Dr. Bonfire, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Pretty sure that. Governor, I'm going to ask. Uh, the, the Dean of, of our Faculty of Business and Economic Sciences, Prof. Lloyd, to ask you to file a word of thanks. Um, thank you, uh, Mr. Um, 
Before I thank the governor, let me thank each of you that attended the, this evening's uh, lecture for making the time and to uh, listen and engage with the governor. It's not an opportunity we get every day. So thank you for attending tonight. And I also want to thank our council and our vice chancellor for, of course, making these opportunities available to us to engage with uh, the prominent South Africans decision makers that we only see on television and here on the radio, making imminent uh, declarations while they're standing here. So I don't know, uh, the 25 by this point, Governor, hopefully that will not be an imminent uh, <laughs> <laughs> announcement you'll make. Um, Deputy Vice Chancellor of Learning and Teaching, thank you very much for also providing your time and doing the welcoming for us. And then, of course, uh, our uh, esteemed uh, Master of Ceremonies or Director of the Program, Professor Poisa, thank you for uh, your service and, of course, also for providing the facilities of the Business School uh, for this uh, event. And then uh, the um, various staff um, that make all of this come seamlessly together. Ms. Renelle Peterson from our faculty office and uh, Ms. Yanda and Charlie from the governor's office. Of course, thank you very much for all the behind the scenes work that you've been doing and making this possible. And uh, the support staff under the guidance of Ms. Sharon Matsiza. Thank you very much, Sharon, to you and the staff. We appreciate that. And um, then also, uh, something that you will enjoy uh, within a few minutes, the catering outside, uh, under the guidance of my dear colleague, uh, Dr. Paul Tahim, thank you for you and the catering staff for uh, for uh, uh, the arrangements. And then, um, as uh, the governor has referred to you, uh, Tian, the young man here, that's <laughs> thank you for the, the e-technology that you've provided to us uh, amongst the challenging ESCOM moment. Um, it worked well, and uh, we uh, appreciate that. And uh, then, of course, Governor, last but very importantly, thank you for um, coming to share your ideas with us this evening. Um, when I saw the topic, I, I was intrigued to, to link climate change very much to what the Central Bank can do. But um, thinking of what you've explained to us, um, it makes eminent sense that I think the central bank has got a very prominent role to play in the climate change mitigation strategies and policies that we, we see. And um, we see climate change having, of course, profound economic effects. It impacts um, the supply side very specifically, resulting in massive supply side shocks. Um, things from the labor supply, productivity, capital accumulation, and so on. And of course, as you've indicated to us, that temperature increases and GDP growth is unfortunately inversely related, and that creates macroeconomic volatilities. So using the metaphor of the neural network that uh, necessitates policy coordination to reduce these macroeconomic volatilities will, of course, then be an eminent role that the central bank play going forward. And as you've indicated, climate change is a multidisciplinary activity, and it will require the input from everybody and every policy-making unit within the country. And, of course, being at the business school and being at the university, of course, we require new skills to tackle the changes that uh, the climate change will bring about. It will, of course, necessitate the rethinking of investment into the green economy and to decarbonize our economy. Marketing will <coughs> only contribute 4%, maybe it's 4% too much. But of course, as we continue, we will look at how we can upskill and reskill our students and our staff to speak into this new uh, space of the green uh, economy. Because for, and first and foremost, most of our minds these days are is artificial intelligence. And of course, within that, the green economy should also play a very, very important role. And uh, sitting in the Eastern Cape, the motor industry also plays a very important role. And rejigging that sector will be a very important decision for us sitting in the Eastern Cape province uh, as such. So with that said, Governor, please accept this 
as a small token of our appreciation for your time and spending it with us this evening. We appreciate it and hopefully by looking at this, you will remember the evening and all the interesting questions and probably. <laughs> I'm going to invite each of you um, to please join us outside. There are some uh, refreshments as I alluded to, and also you will have some time to engage with the governor. And as I said, maybe take a photograph of you, governor. Thank you very much, governor. <laughs>